yeah, how's things? How's the day been going so far? Oh yeah, it's. I mean, everything's been、um, obviously difficult, but I've been trying to keep busy. In this in in this time, I mean New York. It's just today, just it just got a little bit gl-、uh, like grim the last two days because it started raining, and it hasn't been that bad o- over the summertime because you can sort of eat outside and and to be quite honest, there's no bridge and tunnel, and there's no tourists, so it hasn't been it hasn't been terrible. There's been losses, but lifestyle's been okay. And then, but then it just started like it was like raining and cold the last two days, and it sort of was just like a scary little preview of.、Um, What New York's going to be like in the winter during the lockdown? Yeah, the winters can get pretty rough, though, can't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's a tundra. <laughs> Some years, <laughs> I mean, I've been here for enough time to know that. Yeah, some winters aren't as bad, but some of them are just、uh, horrific. Like you just, I remember, I think it was like 2014, late in 2014, I was like going to a, like a label meeting、uh, on Broadway, and I, I was at my girlfriend's house, and I like. Had jumped out of the shower and then just ran out because I was running late and my hair froze to my head on the way to the meeting. Man! And they're like, "Don't rush your fingers through your hair. You'll just pull your hair out." It was, it was, it was, it was like minus something, minus twenty wind chill or something like that. It was insane. That's terrifying. Yeah, it can get pretty hectic, but hopefully, it's. I mean, I I know that they've passed a whole bunch of outdoor dining laws and. I think they're allowed to use space heaters and stuff. So hopefully, the I mean, the restaurant industry is going to take a hit, but it, hopefully, it doesn't take a hit too bad. You know. How long have you been in New York? How long have you stayed there? Um, I've been on and off for I think my first I got my first place here in two thousand yeah two thousand fifteen or sixteen. But then I went back to I was in LA for a year before that, and then I was and then I went to LA for like a year and a half. Now I'm, I've been back now for nearly two years. Nice. I mean, I imagine they're quite different culturally, New York and LA.、Like、yeah,、that. I mean they're miles apart. I think.、Uh, I love New York. I went I went back to、um, LA for a relationship and. And that ended, and then I came back here. <laughs> New York's my favorite, my favorite place on earth. It's hard for me to to compare the two because of how much I love New York. Do you think you love reliever? Is that you kind of there set for life? Yeah. Um. I. Um. It's funny you say that. I'm actually leaving on Tuesday for a little while, purely for work reasons. You know, there's not. I don't think there's going to be much live music、uh, happening in in America at, at all、uh, in the next sort of six or seven months. And. I'm actually going to. I'm coming to Europe, so I've got I've got a a place that I work out of、um, a studio I work out of in Florence. Nice. So I'm going to Florence on Tuesday for I guess my, my, the the simple future is for the next maybe six months or seven months. See how I go. I know that I've got. I mean, I've got some tame stuff coming up in the middle of next year, but until then, I've been working on a couple of projects of my own. And I think that's going to be the best place to sort of start. I can sort of play. You can play these sort of outdoor gigs in in Europe right now, and yeah, especially for a size of for the size of shows that I do. Whatever five hundred five hundred cap spaces, I can sort of play outside solo. If you know what I mean. Yeah, it'd be good to give those songs allow them to kind of breathe in that space. Yeah, I mean, I like I love playing solo. I've missed it. I haven't played solo in about three years. Oh, but another lightning, maybe like two and a half years. So I miss playing solo and. I think I'm going to try and do one if the weather's okay in Florence. There's a beautiful amphitheater just outside of Florence in Fiorentino, and it's、uh, it's like a 2,000 cap old Roman amphitheater. They've started doing shows at because everything's at 25 percent capacity right now. I feel like I can、um, maybe put a show in there in October, November if the weather permits. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean I'm excited about it. How have you found not playing live? I imagine this is the longest you've gone without playing for a while. Yeah, yeah, this is the longest I've been. I've The longest in about ten years, I think it's probably longer than that. I mean, it's always like I've always sort of juggled in between、uh, my Tame Impala commitments, and before that it was Pond as well, and then and my, then my solo stuff. So I come pretty much straight off a tour with Tame, and then go back onto one of my tours or finish one of my tours and go back on. Like a couple of years ago, it was like I had I did like a solo run, and then I went straight back out with、uh, Tame, and then I did a tour with the Arctic Monkeys and. And so I'm, I'm, I'm. To, to answer in short, yes, I'm missing, missing playing very, very much. Have there been any advantages from kind of getting a wee bit of time to pause for breath? Though, is there anything that you've yeah you've found from it? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I've definitely, you definitely this this whole time. I feel like that's been with a lot of people, whether you're creative or not. You've sort of been forced to uh sit with yourself. If you know what I mean? You sort of sit with yourself and sort of you sort of take. Like take stock of what you're doing and what you've done and how you feel about this and how you feel about that. I remember having some different ambitions, the sonic ambitions. If you want, if we're, if we're talking music, like sort of towards the end of last year, and now it's sort of just changed everything because I because I, I sort of just for the first like 
I was completely by myself for the first eight weeks. Didn't see anybody. And I just had a studio in my apartment. So I was just sort of going over literally everything I've done over the last like, <laughs> like two years. So like demos and ideas and, and sort of no, like notes. I have, you know, thousands of pages of, of notes. And, um, and then like thousands of voice memos and things like that that I've sort of accumulated. And it's kind of like, I was like, oh, yeah, that's the sort of headspace I was in when I was doing that. And it's weird. I don't feel like that anymore at all. Is it, ever, is it working or reliving those moments through hearing it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, what the, what the fuck is that? <laughs> like, I'm just like, what is this? What, <laughs> what was I thinking? Like, what was it like? Cause, but I guess it's just, I, I can be like that sometimes in general. So, you know, if I'm not uh, paying attention, like a broader goal, sometimes I can, I, I very easily fall down rabbit holes, which can be good, but sometimes it's bad. <laughs> Where do you start when you're, when you're looking through that stuff of those thousands of memos and thousands of notes? Where do you kind of begin? Kind of where I'm at and go backwards. Like, for instance, if I'm opening up a, a live Ableton live session, I look for, I look at like the most recently done one. And then, and I've got, you know, they're all marked like point one, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 2.2, you know, tempo up 2.5. Like if I'm sort of really sort of trying to sculpt a song of something or ideas or I sometimes I put dates on them I usually go from where I am and work backwards and just to see where I've come from if I'm going to go somewhere else with it what sort of things do you notice when you're looking back through it that you might not have been able to see at the time when you were initially first working on it so, I mean sometimes it's um where the inspiration for something came from so say like I'm, I'm, I'm going just for instance I was working on something yesterday and it was something that it's a song that I've had for like three years and I forgot completely forgot about this like thing that i um sped up in the verse because i did it like a 4.1 and a 4.2 and in the 4.2 i slowed back down the verse i was like oh why i mean how did i even forget about sometimes i'm working on two or three things at once and i just completely forgot about this time that i almost like double timed the the b section and it sounded cool so it's i don't know i just i just look for like the little inspired bits and 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 it makes me think about where how i would have even come up with that with that idea if that makes sense yeah i guess if you've changed as a person as well in the interim they can kind of spark different things within you that they wouldn't yeah totally that's and that's a big thing for me i'm I'm, i uh, to a fault sometimes i'm a bit of an open book with my music so you know you grow and you want to say different things and well you yeah you i guess every like everybody does you sort of look inward a bit more and figure out a way to say sometimes say things with less words sometimes say things with more words sometimes say things with faster slower ideas i don't know try, and try to like see the whole thing through don't try I've, I've, I've been actively working to not be so impulsive with my music making you know sort of think about stuff a little bit more you mentioned as well that you kind of you had a few projects that you've been working on how do you how do you group stuff how do you know what's kind of going to come together and, and fit as one and work as a kind of maybe something that's going to be more of a body of work i don't i don't a lot of the time um i mean i've i have ideas like the one thing, the main thing I'm working on is a short film that I shot like f- five years ago, probably five years ago. Yeah, so that's the main thing. So it's a short film with me in it driving across America and it sort of explores these um, five stages of grief. I've, I became sort of really into, um, I'm a big sort of philosophy junkie and psychology junkie and um, I got really into um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I had like a loss, like I lost someone in my life and... And so this, this footage kind of, we shot this footage really sort of back, like hap stance. And then anyway, so, and then, and then I, we didn't really know what to do with it for years of me and a, and a friend of mine, Mike Bennett's director. And we didn't really know what we were doing. And we were just sort of making stuff up every day. And, and then sort of, at the one more I looked at it and I went over it, I was like, it could be this. And so I shot a bunch of extra footage at the end of last year uh, in Los Angeles with a friend of mine, which was sort of tied it into more of a concept this sort of reshoot stuff and then but then i'm basically then i'm scoring the out so it's it'll be it's kind of going to be like a short film that's an ep that i want to sort of play the show on the road as well if i can um next year so that that has been taking up a lot of my head space um sometimes deadlines to answer your question sorry that was a bit of a roundabout answer but sometimes it's deadlines that 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 to decide what you're working on like i just this morning before you before we spoke i was working on a trailer for another of a short film that's in the film festival doing the film festival circuit now um that my that guy mike shot like last year and so during quarantine i scored that film and did the sound design for that film so 
and then he goes, "Oh, I need to get a trailer for it for a certain um, for a certain music festival." And so I did that <laughs> this morning. So, yeah, that short film about the five stages of grief sounds fascinating, though. Basically, it's it's just um, it's, it's, I mean, I guess the elevator pitch is just a guy going across, and then as he's driving, he's leaving these answering machine messages, and uh, you can feel the sort of and you know, well, like, I've tried to make it so you can feel. Uh, it feels very real and you can feel uh, the stages because the, st- the five stages are um, it's uh, denial, anger, depression, bargaining and acceptance are the five stages and and if I've so yeah if you've read I don't know if you've ever read anything about it but if you've read like I've read like uh, Death and Dying and Grief and Grieving and she she was a really interesting person herself Elizabeth Kubler-Ross her philosophy I think she was kind of spiritual but scientific and and I've always been fascinated with her. And then, oh, well, I've always had a t- taken a fascination. And then I had a bereavement in the family and I got more and more into it as an idea. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. So that, that's sort of my, been my main focus. I'm editing that right now and then making the songs sort of all have a, have a linear idea about. So like eventually I'd, I'd like to play. It's a short film. It's only like 14 minutes long, but it's like I'd like to play sections of it when I start playing live. Yeah. When you shot that initial footage, five years ago how has your kind of mindset changed between then and shooting footage for it humongously again kind of in quite different stages of the process yeah humongously humongously back then i didn't like i said I did, we didn't really know what we were doing like we, we were just shooting something about something about grief and something about loss and some and then and we didn't really know what it was and then i've done more and more and more reading over the last couple of years and, and i just and i wanted to find something because i think the be- the footage is really beautiful there's like some vistas over like taos new mexico and uh, some beautiful shots from Arizona and Kansas when you're driving through like Big Sky, and uh, I I guess like but when we shot it I was like I think I was it was like the first I was driving to to be like I was driving my stuff from Los Angeles to New York because I was moving and Mike the director was like what are you doing this week and I said I'm moving and he and he's like what do you mean are you just gonna fly I was like no no I just chucked everything in a van and I'm just gonna drive he's like by yourself I was like yeah I love it I love because I'd driven across so many times touring with bands I just I love it I love driving driving is like my release kind of sometimes and so I just did it and he goes can I come with you and I was like yeah sure so he just flew over and as I left my house I picked him up at LAX and we drove across together and then every day we'd write like a funny little, like funny little scene, sort of this, some sort of scene, some idea. I was like trying my best. The acting is terrible, <laughs> but it's all, it'll all come, it, hopefully it'll all come out in the edit. <laughs> it sounds like a really kind of free fluid thing, though. Like quite a yeah, it was. It started. Experience. It started really. It started really free flowing, and the more and more I watched it, the more and more I drew from things that have happened to me over the last two or three years, and turned it more into a. Um, into a story there's a story there there's more of a narrative it's not like a it's not it's not like um there's obviously not a whole bunch of dialogue but the answering machines messages that you hear along the way kind of uh signpost the protagonist's state you know <laughs> does that ever happen in music as well does the narrative sometimes kind of reveal itself as you as you get further yeah. in the process yeah definitely the definitely um one of my really good friends i who i write a lot of music with uh there are a lot of lyrics with he like when I'm sitting around with him, he's like, "You should take that, take that word out, and maybe it's this." And I said, "Oh, that's really good." He goes, "Yeah, I don't like that lyric," but he goes, and but he was the one that understood me. He's like, "You would never have got to this place if you hadn't have written that cheese dick lyric. Like it's a kind of cheesy." He's like, "If you had, if you, if you had never written that really cheesy one, you would never have come up with this one." You know, like it's and and I for a long, 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 long time have been a process over product you know person i think when i was like in the growl and like the first band i was ever in i always thought thought that like process was more important than the product obviously the product is but like i think you're not learning anything once you've already put it out well i don't anyway personally i guess the emotional release as well kind of comes during that journey totally but i mean i kind of love like the when you're piecing it all together and that's what you remember you know I mean, I guess if you're like a superstar, you remember like playing big stadium shows and people singing those words. But then again, I guess like things would happen like I've never played. I mean, I've played them in tame, but I never played with my music. I have. Uh, I never played like in like a big stadium show. I, I guess songs can take on different meanings for other artists after the fact. You know, you know, some maybe a sad song that you didn't want to play ever. You know, twenty thousand people relate to and they want to sing it. So all of a sudden, it gives you a different feeling than it initially did. You know, initially you wrote it about like whatever heartbreak or 
or um, a, a terrible time in your life, but then and so you you didn't particularly like playing it again because it reminds you of that thing. But then maybe it re- maybe it's maybe it's the big sing along in your set now. You know, is it ever easy to like romanticize kind of heartbreak when you're working on it with music and you're creating? Do I romant- do, do, I, do, I, you, do I romanticize? Is it easy to kind of do that when you're when you're crafting something beautiful from a hard or a hard experience? Kind of. I kind of. I think I did that so much when I was young. Okay. Like I used to write a lot of stuff that was just so literal. And, and it, I think it's like, it's like uh, how Jerry Seinfeld talks about using the word, using the F word, because he doesn't swear in his stand up sets um, ever. So he's like, getting, he's like, using the F word or cussing in general is like, uh, it's like getting in a Ferrari, you know? He's like, where, like, and of course, of course, you, if you're going to zoom size someone in the Ferrari, they're like, whoa, because you can, you can drop the F bomb or whatever you want to say. He's, but he's more of a like a um, like a Model T Ford guy. I think he says something like that. I think he, I think I can't remember the car he used, but he said he's like I'd rather I'd rather show up to to the drag race in like a a Ford pickup truck or something like that. That's how I feel. My comedy isn't, and in the same way, there's a guy. This uh, this is amazing writer Rainier Rilke. He's written one of my favorite books of all time. Um, letters to a young poet, and he's writing. He's giving advice to this young poet, and he's like, don't ever um love songs it's something along the lines of like love songs are the easiest ones to write but they're the hardest to master and i feel that like they're the easiest ones because you're sad and you're i mean they are for me anyway you're sad and you're upset and you're whatever and and you can just sort of say all this stuff and i've definitely guilty very very guilty of that on like especially my first record and the more and more i get grow older and the more and more i realize it's like the the more fun thing to do is yeah make make everything a a little bit more uh I guess transcendental, like where it can be, it can we can have multiple meanings. It means a lot to you, but so like I don't, I try. I literally have been trying my hardest over the last like year and a half to not write any sort of songs about love or anything like that. <laughs> sort of a bit more reflective rather than like looking in rather than looking out, if that makes sense. So yeah, Rain, I think Rainy Rilke says he's like yeah, the hardest, the best poems in the world are love songs, and the best, some of the best songs in the world are love songs, and and that's they're, they're the easiest to write but the hardest to be good at if that makes sense the same it, it, am i making sense with my rainy rilk and jerry seinfeld uh yeah references sure. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I completely get what you're saying i mean when now that you've kind of you you're speaking there about this kind of conscious this idea to look past love songs for a bit and kind of dive into other aspects of yourself how is that what sort of stuff have you been looking at and how is that going to change your perception of yourself if you're kind of looking a bit more internally yeah, it's. I mean, it's changing. It's definitely changed me a lot. You know, um, whether it's with like from experiences of growth or loss. It, like like loss always like it's always very turbulent. Those things are, are turbulent, and trauma in, in, is 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 inherently tur- turbulent. But I think there's it's when it, when everything calms after that is when you can really start looking at yourself. I guess you start to i guess I'm just, I'm just getting older you start to look at like the way that you handle everything the way that you see everything oh, it's changed me immensely like i have started writing more about how i interact with the rest of the world not just with like whoever's in my whoever's directly in front of me and how i and how i re- react not even so much interact how i react to you know whether it's i don't know world events or things anyone's and anyone that anything that anyone says to me on the street uh, rather than going like they did this and they did that I'll, it's more like this is how i feel about this is how this made me feel but then try and use less words try and use less dis- descriptive words so so something happens to me or i feel something you know then it's like how did that make me feel and how would how not how would it make everyone else feel but how would anyone else arrive at this feeling and then try and find a, a, a scenario where uh, more people would feel how I'm feeling right now. You know, I mean, am I making sense? It's like, um, yeah, yeah. How like so? so it's not so. It's like you, I stub my toe on a curb. Um, that hurts my foot, which then hurts. You know, then um, goes into my knee. If this if this is making sense at all, like say I roll my ankle and, and the injury ends up in my knee. I try and think of another way that more and more people might hurt their knee. <laughs> and rather than it's something specifically that happened to me it's more about like a, a a a series of words or chords or a feeling that might make someone feel like um i'm not just singing about stuff that's happened to me you know make it a bit more relatable 
how does that affect the kind of presentation of it then? Because obviously with the, the debut record, it was very kind of lush, you know, orchestral arrangements because of the romance of the of the lyricism. Has that changed now going forward if you're kind of moving away from it a wee bit? Uh, a little bit. To- yeah, yeah, totally, actually. I, I think um, definitely it's not as blunt, I think is the best, best way to put it. It's not as blunt as the first record. It's sort of, the, the more stuff I've been doing, it's sort of, I'm trying to make it feel a more if 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 this makes sense at all i see i don't know how you guys hear my music as to how i do so i think i'm trying to make it a bit more um like it feels a lot more personal like some of the stuff like i i'm a big um i have obs- obsessions i have an obsession with answering machine messages so i've i've made i've like all through the new album there's lots of stuff with like um stuff things that my friends have left me on answering machines like little like skits i guess were they real you know that my friends have recorded i'm like call this number and say say what you think about this yeah so uh i guess so that sort of feels very personal i've got some weird little spoken word bits on the album um the album itself is sort of i think it's taking more of this sort of like mixtapey feel where it's sort of at the moment anyway you know it's not really neat it's not really done at all but it, it feels like it's a bit less linear in its in its presentation uh and the lyrics are definitely different like the lyric, lyrics are, are, like I said, a lot more self-reflective rather than just experience, experience and it, like just purely based on experience. If, uh, it feels like this sort of weird sort of notepad that with bits that are scribbled out and bits that are, um, I guess that's the only way I can describe it right now. But definitely the, lyric, the lyricism is, has sort of stepped away from that, like from that straight up love song style, I guess. It sounds quite rooted in reality as well with what you're saying there about the answering machine messages and stuff. Like it's got kind of more of a direct eye to yourself, like quite literally. Yeah, well, I want, I just want, I want, I want things. That, I seem like the, I felt like the last album, if if I can be critical of it, I felt felt a little bit more like I felt like there was a lot of sheen on it, which is cool. It's a time and a place, and it's got like it it has a time and a place in my whatever. It's in all albums and all pieces of art are just sort of like milestones in you know life for me anyway. Um, so that one is definitely like it has this like like paint job <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> it has this like it has a paint job and wax job and a, and a spoiler you know and some rims whereas this this sort of feels a bit more the stuff i'm doing now feels like a bit more like you're in my living room if that makes sense yeah i think that's part, although what you're saying there about it having this sheen about it, i think that's what partly makes it so effective like when you have that those moments in that first record where you're self-deprecating like look at disposable i think part of the reason why that song works so well and lands with such an impact is that it's done in this kind of grand presentation, but it has this real kind of vulnerable heart to it that is kind of allowed to shine because of that. That's kind of the point, yeah. But um, I'm glad you got. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like that was very much same with Wasted on Fidelity. Is like a big, like joke. Well, it's not a joke, but it's a, it's a very tongue in cheek that song. Yeah, and disposable. And sometimes it might not seem that I'm trying not to take myself too seriously. <laughs> yeah, and that's quite cool as well because the. Again, with the presentation of the album, it's quite American, whereas that kind of idea of being slightly self-deprecating, I know it's quite a British thing, is it? Is that quite prominent in like Australian culture as well? Yeah, yeah. My, my mum's from the UK and, and she doesn't let me get away with much. And a lot of my good friends are from, uh, from England. And yeah, it, it definitely is like, it was a very juxtaposed, the first album was very juxtaposed because as far as the production went, everyone I was around and my friends, um, the studios I was working in and and some of the uh, people I was working with were just, I was like, yeah, I mean, we could put strings. I was like, yeah, dude, let's do it, man. It's like a very, especially in Los Angeles, it's a very yes place, if you know what I mean. It's like, I'm going to do that. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do the strings. We can do that. I so say every sort of whim that I had, like, let's put some horns on it. Oh, let's get some, uh, let's get this 16 piece string section. Let's, um, we, like, we recorded the strings in like the place where they recorded the strings for Psycho on that album. <laughs> You know, Hitchcock Psycho. So everything, so that was very American about it. But I guess that some, a lot of the lyricism was was a bit self-deprecating. There are there's, there are moments of like American-ish swaggery bits where I'm sort of just giving it the big one, if that makes, you know what I mean? Watch me take away is kind of got that swagger about it. Yeah, yeah, that's like, yeah, that was like, uh, that album, the whole, you know there was like going to be a whole album that sort of just sounded like that because I'm such a, the, like, Waits, I love Tom Waits and I love Nick Cave birthday party so there was like a, gonna be a whole album where it just pretty much sounded like that and then it just sort of i moved to la and it just sort of took on this whole other feeling you know making music you know it's just definitely, it's definitely got a californian sound that that record i know you mentioned doing the the strength of the record in the same place i did the stuff for psycho 
Was that quite important to you? Were you into films like that kind of growing up? No, not growing up. I guess like when I was growing up, I had a pretty limited like film thing. Like we were pretty, we were really poor. We didn't really have a lot of, I had like, I just remember having as a kid, I had like stuff that I'd taped off the TV. I had Back to the Future 2 and Star Wars. I guess they've all got pretty good, if you think about it, they've all got pretty good. Um, who does uh, Back to the Future? Zemeckis. Yeah. I was going to say Zemeckis. Zemeckis and then John Williams did Star Wars. And then I had, what was the other one that I was really into? I had like two or three on film. And then like Disney stuff. But then as I got old, I didn't really get like into cool stuff until I was like oh, way older. Like I think I was like 20. I didn't even read like, I don't think I read like, I, re- I didn't really have, didn't really like read that much at all when I was a kid. I was kind of dyslexic and, and ba- I failed English. Uh, I was the only, only kid in my class to fail English. So I didn't even read, I didn't think I read a book until I was like 21, like a full book. And my, you know Nick from Pond? Yeah. Um, Nick got me when we were living together. I think I was 20 or 21 when we were living together. I don't remember. Uh, he like one year, he's like, I can't believe that you don't read. <laughs> he's like, you're not a, he can't believe you're not a reader. So Nick got me, um, he's like, my, my, my Christmas gift to you is the book, is the gift of reading. And he got me On the Road, Nick Caves and the Ass Sully Angel. The Sun Also Rises by uh, Ernest Hemingway. And one more. Oh, yeah, The Outsider, Albert Camus. And then I, after that, I became a really big, I read a lot. Those are four very well-chosen novels to try and trip someone yeah, he's got He's got amazing, Nick's got amazing taste in books. Um, and Nick, so Nick got me that. That was like, my, that was like the first time I'd, I started like reading books all the time. So like I didn't, and, I, and so that's what, what sort of picked my interest into like really cool filmmaking. And yeah, I think as I got older, like over the, the last 10, probably just, just, probably just the last 10 years, nine years, I've, I've got like, I'm a big film of, like I love films. And that's like sort of why I've been sort of transitioning into um, filmmaking a little bit. A little bit. I still want to make albums, but I feel like I, I feel like the thing about songwriting for me has always been about the story. I think if I look at it from a b- broader spectrum, I, it's like I said, this year I've been taking stock of everything that I've been doing or have done. And if I think about the sonics of my last album, because you can't help but look back sometimes, you think about the sonics of my last album, they're very cinematic okay, in some spots, you know. And then, and, and, I, and I also, also would lo- I love like a really, really, really strong narrative. Like I started doing spoken word about five years ago. Like there's one track on the like deluxe, <laughs> deluxe, deluxe album. If anyone's, uh, if anyone wants to get it, um, the deluxe Camp Avery album has got a, a spoken word on it. And so I sort of, I've been always been into this sort of big sort of telling storytelling thing. So that's how I sort of have sort of been like dipping my toes and transitioning into film. I've started writing a lot of screenplays and, and stuff like that. So is that was that whoever said gambling is for suckers? Is that on the only on the deluxe version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that. I mean, that's a fascinating song because it really takes that kind of that narrative idea that's kind of sprinkled out the first album and is present in all the songs and does it in quite a literal and yeah, yeah. Well, I started I started writing full on. Um, that's why I wanted to do this this film and and score the film and then the other thing I'm going to Italy for is I wrote a short film. Um, an Italian, it's a black and white Italian film that we're going to shoot in January. Oh, it's another short film. It's like a 12-minute short film uh, just about about the same thing, about you know, process over product, about work. And So I wrote it like late last year, like August, September. And then I, um, yeah, and so we're going to try and shoot. And I, I, I know a couple of amazing actors in, um, in Italy, so I'm sort of translating it with them uh, at, right now. And then we're going to shoot it in, I think, Probably January, February, or something like that. Are you going to do that in uh, Florence? Yeah, yo, it's an Italian film set in Florence, in cast by Italians. Like, I don't, I don't speak enough Italian to like translate the whole script. But um, yeah, I guess that'll be my first thing that I've officially gonna like direct. And yeah, there's and other stuff. I've I've been working on a couple of other screenplay stuff because I just I kind of it's sort of a bit of a release for me sometimes because I'm not bound by you know whatever four and a half minutes or and it doesn't have to rhyme. It's just a story. <laughs> It can have a fluidity about it as well in the same way music does. You can, you know, there's a rhythm to cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like, that's been the hardest thing. I've started writing my first feature length thing and uh, I've been more and more this last like two weeks reading, um, uh, reading, reading other others people's screenplays that I admire and just watching films that I love and, and just sort of seeing how like, how the plot develops for two different characters and when when you focus more attention on this person and that person and yeah the flow of everything has been something that i've had to that you have to grasp if you're writing anything longer than 12 15 minutes i was gonna say what screenplays were you reading 
that you've kind of uh, checked last out? week I read No Country for Old Men it's one of the greatest films of all time in my opinion and oddly my friend goes why is that one of your favourite films and he goes "It's." and I didn't even notice for such a long time I've, I've watched it I, I can't count how many times I've watched it but he goes he goes it's so funny that your you know your top three all time favourite movies doesn't even have any music in it and I was like whoa I didn't even notice you know it's that's why and I guess that's why that film feels so real to me it's because there's no um, it must feel so real to everybody and terrifying because there's no as the suspense builds there's no like or like you know there's nothing it's just it's just a guy standing behind the door with his socks on about to shoot you with a shotgun with a silencer on it <laughs> silence has never sounded so loud in a film yeah i mean yeah it's it's such a it's i mean it's, it's flawless that film and then i, I was reading inglorious bastards i've got that one just because i love i love that film and i just sort of not that like the thing i'm the thing i'm writing is really sad and dramatic so but I just sort of love the flow of dialogue in uh, uh, Tarantino films. I haven't got, I've, been, I've watched, been watching a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson stuff. Um, I watched Eight and a Half the other night. I watched Breathless, which, I mean, I love uh, anything by John Luc Godard. It's great. I don't know. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> Are you drawing on, um, you mentioned Eight and a Half there. Is that something you're kind of drawing on for the Italian shot? Is there anything there that's going to carry in? Um, aesthetically, it's it's got some and kind of kind of kind of it's it's it still feels pretty real. It's, a, it's the film's called Lavoro. It's just about and that's a working title. It's just it's, that's Italian just for work. So it's just about it's the same thing. It's about process over product. It's about remembering that remembering that the the thing the thing you appreciate most, the thing that you remember most, and when you make something or even when you experience anything is 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 the like is the hard work that you do you know i mean if I, I i'm if if i can speak to any of that i can i can tell you that um i love playing shows and love feeling those shows but it's such a different experience from learning experience from when you're making it you know hey, at what point did you did you kind of come to that realization was that something you had in your head from the kind of the beginning no not really um i was i was sort of you know when you're like young you just want to be in a band and you just want to write music and stand on stage and play songs and my fr- actually my friend gave me that book this girl I had a crush on when I was like 20 <laughs> gave me um, uh, Letters to a Young Poet, this Randy Rilke book, and it's really cool. I mean, if it's one of my, it's like a mantra of mine. It's like a, a centering point. It's like a centering mechanism. Uh, I read it every now and then because it sort of just makes me, you just remember that like, rem- reminds me that like sometimes in your, in the, the depth of your sadness or when you really, really feel like you can't, um, you can't do it or you, you're, you're second guessing everything that's usually at the point where you got to hold on to those feelings while you're down there in that weird place and write it down and, and experience it feel everything you know I think Taika Waititi did it in the end of um, and it was what really shocked me he's a friend of mine and, and, and I, I hadn't seen that to Jojo Rabbit he says it, and Milka, Marie Rilke quote right at the end it says let everything happen to you that always reminds me that like that as whilst you are creating is, is a very important thing for me. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess I was like 20 or 21, maybe. No, I would have been older than that. 20, 22, 23. After I'd read, I think I'd read like all those books that Nick had gotten me. Yeah. This girl gave me this book and it sort of like changed my, my, my whole process of changed. It had a huge impact on changing how I work, you know? And at the same time, I think, um, I'd heard like bone machine by Tom Waits. And that made me think, whoa, there's no one way of making an album. Like, like that's still my favorite album to this day of all time. And like you, you, the first time I heard that, I was just like, what the fuck is this, man? <laughs> like, like, what is this? Like, it just got these, it's got these sounds of just like logs hitting on the ground and these squeaky chairs and these beautiful, these spoken words. And then like, it sounds like all of his amps have been dropped on the ground. And but then like the more and more I listened to it, the more like I found these little idiosyncrasies, and I thought you can make whatever you want. You can do you can make do whatever you want as long as you, it means something to you. And I don't know. I guess that was that was I was probably twenty three, twenty four is when I when I realized that that was the most important part, the, the the making of it. You know. You were speaking about how you always come back to like from a young poet, and you know you you revisit and you reread it quite frequently. What other pieces of art, whether that be albums or films, do you kind of find yourself coming back to a lot? And still being able to to gain something from it goes in stages. Stuff that I always come back to is that book. I go. I went through like a huge. I went through a huge thing with Channel Orange about three years ago. My friend Koshin. I was like like every day. I was into it every day. That see that's not that's not the same. That's not the right thing. That's not what you just asked me. I guess it's like 
I love Letters to a Young, young Poet. I love Bone Machine. It sort of reminds me of what it does the most is those two things. I guess films, I didn't really have any super favorite ones that like gave me, I don't think even I had the emotional maturity to appreciate really exquisite cinema until I got a bit older. Like I was like, I think like my favorite film when I was 22 was like Pulp Fiction or something like that. Or might've been even like something more cheesy than that. Might've been like, it might, it might've been more like the, the joke in Tame Impala is like, yeah, when Cam can't sleep, no one sleeps because Cam sits in the back lounge of the bus and listens and watches ex- they quote unquote explosion films. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> yeah, like they're like, yeah, I couldn't sleep last night. Cam was had insomnia, so he put on Terminator Two at three in the morning. Yeah, I guess I, d- I didn't really not films to answer your question. Not films did I have like as something that I always came back to. But I think Rainy that book that book and that album remind me of the conviction I had when I was like twenty four. I was talking about this with a friend of mine a couple of days ago that it always reminds me of like, because now these days, sometimes when I'm putting stuff together, I'm like, oh, should that be like that? Or maybe that's not that. Maybe that doesn't even need to be on there. And which is good, you know, as you get older, you should, you know, not act as impulsively. And then like, but I, but I loved the pure and utter conviction I had when I was, when I was like 24, I was like, fuck you. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I had, I was, I was, I had a lot. I was, uh, I was fearless. So um, I was listening to some other podcast. I was listening to this Joe Rogan podcast, and I think it was like uh, he was talking with this amazing psychologist. I can't remember his name. And there's that Bob Dylan quote that Bob Dylan took from somewhere else. It's like in order to be an artist, you've got to be, you got to have no fear, no meanness, and no envy. So when I listen to when I read Rainy Rilke that that book in particular, and I listen to Bone Machine, I I have that feeling. I feel like. That fearlessness that you're speaking about is what gets you to the position you're in today. And then once you get there and you start to kind of change, the music does as well. Like what you were saying there about reaching emotional maturity, I imagine that has quite a sizable impact upon your creativity as well and changes it in quite a fundamental way. Totally. I feel like I, feel like I didn't like, I, as much as I admire that in my 20, I mean, it's not that long ago, but it's eight years ago. No, but a lot's happened between now and then to me, I feel anyway. I say all the time, I'm like, I, don't, I won't know like shit until I'm like 40. Especially for the the things that I want to say and and the things I want to feel, take it or leave it. Like I'm not trying to be self deprecating. I just don't think I'll make anything great until I'm until I'm a little bit older. I don't have. I'm still. I'm still like. I still feel like a kid. You know. I didn't. You know. You don't really grow up a lot when you're in a band. <laughs> you know. I mean, I would talk about that. One of my friends is a professional sportsman, and, and I was like, "You are, you're still." And he's forty three. Well, you're still a kid, man. I was like, because all you've ever done since you were 17 is play a game, win a game, <laughs> you know. There's something, there's something about that, though, completely devoting your life to, whether it be sport or art, and just giving everything to it that is... I had a mentor in sport when I was younger, and, and, he, uh, and he instilled that in me. He was like, pick something and commit your entire life to it, and, you, and you'll be completely rewarded, whether it's winning or losing. Losing, more importantly. You know? What's the most important lesson you've learned from losing? Mm, the obvious one is that not, what not to do. When you lose, you uh, there's like it checks your ego, makes you question your decision making in a good way, makes you work harder the next time you do it, makes you know it when you're in that position again, you'll know exactly where you are. Like l- losing again, uh, yeah, losing is 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 far more important than winning, I think. And and no, you know, you, it's hard to fail in art because you know everything's subjective. It's a, you know you can make anything that's anything and it can be anything and who's to say whether it's good or bad other than popular opinion you can definitely um take wins and losses away from certain things it's hard to think about sometimes but to take wins and losses away from things that you've made or shows that you've done or whatever films books you there's always like self-reflection it's it, it ultimately i guess losing ultimately boils down to self-reflection it's quite like a potent. It's quite a potent catalyst for self-reflection. There's nothing else that really drives it like failure, and that forces you to kind of look in on yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no like winning. Like winning, you just you, you. Most of the time, you're experiencing euphoria, and you're experiencing. There's all these other chemicals going around in your brain. You're not really thinking about the next stage, at least not for a little while. You know, you're not going to be thinking about how to improve unless there's a greater goal. You know, once you achieve a goal, it's like the guy who sort of. He was like a big sort of mentor when I was a kid. He used to say, make your, make your goals uh, measurable and achievable. And, and unless you've got, when you win something, unless you've not achieved the milestone that you set out for yourself, 
you're going to be like, you know, if you, if you haven't achieved that yet, then you're going to be still looking forward. But if you have, if you've done, if you've passed this point, there's going to be a moment where you're just sort of like you know, pure, just sort of joy and you're not really looking at how to fix yourself. I mean, obviously winning's great, but I think, I, I think you can't go through life if you win at everything. I think on that same podcast I was talking about last week, this Joe Rogan one, they were like talking about how he gets, Joe Rogan gets frustrated when he goes to his daughter's soccer games and um, <laughs> no one's keeping score these days anyway. And I was talking about it with my friend. I was like, yeah, well, I just remember like as a kid when I'd lose at things, I would just cry. I would cry and then I'd like have a strop in the car on the way home and I would feel like, you know, whatever, shitty for two days. It was like my eyes. I, was, I played baseball when I was a kid. We would lose. And then like, then, then you want to practice more. You want to get better. You want to practice. You want to, you want to work harder. Whereas like if this thing is just like at the end of a soccer game, these, these kids... I think it like maybe in twenty in twenty twenty, growing up in twenty twenty, they're like, Oh yeah, nobody wins, nobody loses, it's all about participation. <laughs> it's good in some ways, bad in other ways. I don't know. I think I think you should, I think kids should understand losing <laughs> at a young age. You know? Yeah, I mean it, it's kinda it's shielding them from what the real world real world is like as well. Yeah, it is a little bit. A little little bit. I mean I just I just remember I was like, Man, that'd be crazy not learning how to I just I just yeah, I remember losing as a kid. And teaching you a lot about, which just makes you want to work harder at the thing that you want to be good at. You know? I think it's one of those things, like you say, that at the time it makes you feel pretty miserable, but then looking back on it afterwards, you're kind of grateful for that experience and what it taught you and how you use it today. I mean, it still carries through now. Yeah, whether it's in sports or life, love, you know, I mean, anything. You mentioned earlier on as well, just a few minutes back, about someone giving you the advice to kind of set goals for yourself. Mm-hmm. What sort of stuff did you did you have in your head at a kind of earlier age? What were the kind of goals that were kind of quite clear and solidified in your mind that you wanted to achieve and that you were striving for? I didn't really have. I get, those goals I was saying, I played like sports when I was a kid. I was going to like be a professional sportsman until I was like 20, yeah, 18 or 19. To be honest, like I, I think I came out of that world of rules and goals and practice and review and and all that and I sort of like if I really think about it the last 10 years I want to say I've sort of just been going with like passions and and leading my like literally letting sort of like the love for this or or a passion for that point me in the right direction and feeling wanting to feel things wanting to feel like whether it's in when it's in personal relationships whether it's on stage whether it's writing music i want i want to i want to like feel everything i've been very fortunate to have like you know friends like kevin from tame impala and al from the monkeys and stuff who are like really two really un- unbelievable no one could help for two better like mentors to to help me through that and help me along the way but and and give me opportunities to 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 play music on a bigger stage and see what that feels like but other than that, I'm, I've, I've, literally it's weird you asked me that because I've only just sort of started like re, really thinking about goals. Like I, I never really had, I didn't really, I, I, it sounds so dumb, but I didn't really like, I've just done whatever I sort of, whatever I've been feeling over the last 10 years, which is, a, which is I don't think it's a great thing. I should have maybe been a bit more focused. But. I think as well, the life never pans out where you want it to go or where you expect it to go. So setting goals, it kind of feels a little bit, redundant sometimes yeah it does no it does i think it's really important how i was just i mean i think it's really important i just wish i'd had the clarity to see it more i think i was just too caught up in the whole thing you know and 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 yeah and feeling the up and feeling the down and a lot of it has been dictated by a lot of the last 10 years have been dictated by just pretty heavy commitment playing the tame impala and um i was playing in pond before that my solo stuff personal relationships Working when I can on stuff, and but wanting to feel like I've never been one to like I got to feel I got to get this, get it done, so I can get it out and so I can sell it. I think the monetization of it sometimes gives me the gives me the um, give me the shits. I mean, obviously, if I'd done that, I might have had more money than I do now. But <laughs> I, I've never sort of thought about it like that. It's such a cliche thing to say, but I've never really like thought about the money thing, which is something I'm trying to get better at. I guess it's funny you mention that though. I mean, I was just. Um listen to an interview we start before we started this with Julian Casablancas where he was speaking about just how poor money or, or commercial success is as a way of kind of measuring success it's weird how it's become the most prominent one but it's it is kind of the most the poorest yeah I don't I've um I've really really I mean I've I mean obviously you want to be comfortable and make enough money to, to you know pay the pay the bills but um I've never never ever looked at financial success as the as the as the measuring post of like 
of of how how great someone is you know it's like by that measure you know so is the person who invented the washing line i don't know i mean i guess that's great too but i don't know like not in art anyway like by that measure it's like you know exxon you know are really successful (laughs) the guy who runs exxon he's really successful or whatever you know big oil you know those but like i feel like sometimes sometimes not all the time sometimes it's like if you're just looking at dollars and cents and maybe i'm talking from a place of of privilege you know i don't want to speak out of line you know some if someone's got lots of money and someone's doing something really well some something or someone is being exploited so but we're getting political now i don't want to get too into that but it's like you know i like not even just something or someone like an idea is being exploited or uh um yeah a group of people or in case of big oil like the the commodity in the ground like they, it, it, as soon as something becomes a commodity then sometimes it can dilute a, a fulfillment in oneself maybe i don't know i'm still i'm still figuring it out for myself i don't want to i don't, don't don't let anyone quote me on any of this <laughs> no i completely get what you're saying i think that's as well why when you look at people who have kind of spent their whole life striving for this notion of commercial success and that's something that they've always valued themselves upon when they hit midlife they end up having a midlife crisis because they kind of realize that that's not really the key to fulfillment Mm -hmm. and you kind of end up feeling quite empty i guess as a result of that not to be presumptuous but no 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 no. you you know i mean like it's like i mean i think i think what you're talking about there's statistical data (laughs) that says that that that's what a midlife crisis is 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 a lack of fulfillment because the only thing that they've been chasing is um more than financial security for their entire for their entire adult life I, I mean not that i don't you know it's like a, like, like i keep saying it's not that i don't want money and i don't want to work i mean i like I'm, I, like i said like i've been saying this whole time I, I really like the work and i think the work needs to feel fulfilling and maybe i'm too too far one way my mom always says that i am i love my mom and she's always like she's like you're such an artist and you need to stop like just being such an artist and make some money <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, and I'm not I'm not saying I'm, I'm an artist I'm saying that like I think it's maybe half the time that I like get scared and shit can a lot of ideas I'm like nah this feels too like close to the knuckle like for me like it needs it doesn't feel like it needs but I guess I'm getting better at recognizing I'm, I'm I, you know what it's actually been good recently I've been collaborating a lot more with other people and they're good at going like no this is this is this is good like this is good and people that I trust you know I've got to I've got a really good song, uh, friend of mine that I write with, and he doesn't even tell me what to do. If I send him a song, he's like, no, he's just changed that lyric. He's like, and then I'll go, what about this? He's like, yeah, that's it. Or, or, or sometimes it's just some, someone, if I'm in the studio, like I work a lot with Lauren Humphrey. He's amazing. He's a uh, producer here. Oh, he's one of my best friends. And also, like, you know, he's played, with it, played drums with the Last Shadow Puppets and, and uh, Guards, and he also produces a lot of stuff for a lot of people. He's good at going like sometimes I want to show him stuff and he just needs to give me like a yes or no because otherwise I, like otherwise I'll just sit there and stew on it for so long to the point where I'll just delete it. Who's inspired you most creatively in your life? When you're collaborating with other people, you learn these lessons and you learn these different things, and it shows. I you think Ke- like Kev Parker you first and foremost. He like he's the one who first showed me that I could do whatever I wanted to do by myself if I wanted to. I think that when I was living with him when I was younger, he was like he would just do everything by himself. You know, I, we lived together when he was recording. Um, Lonerism. I think he was the biggest one that was just like it sh- it was like there in my face, like sh- just showing me. Not in my, not him in my face, but it was there live. Like I could watch him do it, watch him, you know, you know, compose, write, produce, mix, and now I'm like mastering his own stuff as well. Pretty much, kind of. I think he was the first one that like I just saw this. Like he has, he has ultimate like conviction in his ideas. And my, I mean, sometimes he's say, obviously, obviously everyone second guesses himself sometimes, but he has an amazing incredible conviction in his ideas and and even better you know and his execution is is completely idiosyncratic to him he's uh fearless in many ways uh yeah he was the first he's the he's probably been the biggest creative influence in my entire life i think yeah i guess i'm i mean alex is like one of my is is one of my closest friends and watching him do what he does as well is, is, is is when he whenever we're working together in the studio is a similar thing but i think first and foremost if i'm talking first and foremost it'd be like kev Kev really like changed my brain and showed me that being a solo musician is possible because I was kind of in bands when I met him and stuff. I didn't really have my own solo stuff going. I guess it comes well, you know, we're speaking about emotional maturity earlier that you kind of realize that you can be true to yourself. 
Yeah, totally. And Ke- like, so yeah, Kev never gave me any pep talks. He did sometimes, but it was more like he just sort of showed me by example. He was like, "Look at this," and he wasn't trying to do it, but he didn't. I didn't think he probably didn't realize at the time how much of a big influence he had on me as a twenty whatever year old. I think that was the first. That was the first big one. I was just like, and obviously, yeah. I think I sort of I sort of felt that when I heard his first album, I was like, Jesus, this guy's amazing. And then watching him work was the biggest one. I was like, whoa. Like as a kid, as a young, and like even though we were just sort of buddies and goofing around all the time in the studio, it was watching him completely produce something and and yeah, and have a and have a clear idea and a, and a clear even if he didn't think it was clear, <laughs> have a clear idea and a, and a, and, a, and an, an incredible way to execute it. And believe in it enough to to execute it that way was was probably the the biggest um, one in my life. Has having the like Kevin you said Al as well there has having these people inspire you made you think more about the kind of people that you surround yourself with in life if they can have such a positive effect and totally um, yeah I mean I've never I've luckily never had to really worry about it I mean or everyone in my life has been has been really really great for me really good really good influence like I'm the I'm the only person that sort of like gets in my own way. This has been, I've never really had to worry about it. I've been very lucky. I, mean, I think I met Kev when I was... I had a really good mentor as a kid when I was playing sports. And then when I got older, I met, I met the Tame guys and stopped playing sports and, and then sort of just watched Kevin do that. And then as I got older even more, whatever, whenever I moved to America, I think it was when I moved to America is when I became friends with Al and, and the rest of the Monkeys guys. I met them on a, tame, on a Tame tour, I think, or a Pond tour, and then we became really good friends. I didn't really have any friends in LA when I moved there. Al and I became good friends and yeah so I'm very 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 fortunate and thankful for the people that have my life.